Well, good morning. It's so good to be with you here today. It's Pastor Christian again, coming to you this time from my office. And today we're going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9 through 13. And so if you have your Bible, you can turn there with me now. I'm going to be starting a, a mini-series that I'll be rolling out this week about an event from the life of Elijah. But before we jump in, we need to cover a bit of the backstory. And so Elijah was a prophet in Israel under the reign of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. And, and following a great standoff between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, Elijah was able to call down fire on his altar, proving that the God of the Jews was the true God. Elijah subsequently had the prophets of the false god Baal slaughtered, which drew the ire of Queen Jezebel, who then promised to kill Elijah. And upon hearing this news, uh, Elijah, he made a run for it, telling God that he wished that he was dead. After receiving a pep talk from an angel, Elijah then traveled another 40 days and 40 nights to arrive at Mount Horeb, or, or Mount Sinai, where Moses received the Ten Commandments. And so that's where we're at in the story. Elijah has just run an ultra marathon and he's beat up and he's tired and he's disillusioned. Let's read verses 9 through 13 together. This is 1 Kings 19. This is what we read. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? It's the word of the Lord. Today, uh, today I, I want to talk about how we get stuck. <coughs> how we get stuck. Because... That's Elijah's predicament, isn't it? He's he's stuck. What are you doing here, Elijah? The Lord says to him in verse 9. And listen, at some point in every Christian's life, if not on multiple occasions, our Father will gently come alongside us and say, What are you doing here? What, what are you doing here, Christian?" Or or what are you doing here, Stephanie, or Jason, or Brian, or or Sheila? How how did you end up here? How how did you end up so cynical, or so fearful, or so combative, or so disconnected from my presence? Well, we we find in this passage a a few reasons why Elijah was stuck. And, And number one... Elijah was stuck because he had failed to remember all that God had done for him and through him. When asked in verse 10 what he was doing there, all Elijah could do was focus on the negative. The Israelites, he said, have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. Elijah seems to have forgotten all that the Lord had used Elijah to do. In, in the few weeks and, and years prior. Seems to have forgotten that the Lord had used him to stop the rain by his very word. That the Lord personally fed Elijah by ravens and then attended him by an angel. And that the Lord used Elijah to call down fire from heaven. I, I mean, there are some winds in there, isn't there? But Elijah at this time, he, he just... He can't see them. He can't see the winds. He can't see how the Lord has provided for him and intervened and empowered him and used him to glorify himself. can't see it. All he can focus on is the negative. The Israelites, they've rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars and put your prophets to death. And friend, maybe you find yourself in a similar place right now. All you can focus on is what you've lost. All you can focus on is what you've been denied during this pandemic. 
Your only focus is on what you wish you had. And this, friends, it's a recipe. It's a recipe for getting stuck. Listen, listen to me. Is there any way, is there any way that the Lord has shown you kindness over the last few weeks? Can you think about that with me for a second? Any way that you've been blessed, any way that you've been shown mercy? You know, maybe you could even hit pause on the video right now and think about this for a while. I'll I'll still be here when you get back. I'm not going anywhere, I promise. Have you received any wins, any blessings from God during this trial-filled season? We're called to remember these things, and we're called to thank God for them. And friends, one of the reasons why we we struggle to thank God for our blessings is because we don't receive good things as if they've come from the hand of God. Listen, if if you've ever received flowers before, I, I can't say that I have personally, but many of you, I'm sure, have. If you've ever received flowers from a delivery service before, my, my guess is that you gave a polite thank you to the person who delivered your flowers. Right? You thanked them for bringing them along. But the bulk of your gratitude went to the person who, who paid for them, the, the person who sent you the flowers. And in the same way, church, we need to understand that when open doors come to us in, in our lives, when, when provision comes, when joy comes, when relief comes, That though our Father uses all different types of of messengers or or vehicles to deliver these blessings, He is always the true source. He's always the true source. He's always behind it, if, if only from the background. And therefore, He is the one that we should ultimately be thanking. He should receive the bulk of our praise and our gratitude. Let's take our eyes off the particular delivery system and turn our eyes on the one who's fitting the bull, footing the bill. There we go. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. He is the source. He is the Lord's source. He uses all different types of of delivery systems, doesn't he? But he is our, our source. And so my encouragement to you, if you're stuck right now, is to choose gratitude. Let's choose gratitude. So get creative with it. Set an alarm every hour on your phone. And when that alarm goes off, take take a a minute to just thank God for one thing in your life. What's one thing that you're grateful for? What's one way that you've seen God intervene lately in your life? What's one thing you can do? Or or refuse to get out of bed in the morning or, or to go to sleep at night without perhaps acknowledging 10 things that the Lord has done in your life. This is another kind of game that you can play. We can be creative. Church, we we need to fight for gratitude if we want to get unstuck. And and we want to fight for gratitude, church, because our our king, he is just so worthy of it, isn't he? He's worthy of our gratitude, of our thanksgiving, of our praise. And so we want to step into that in this season. And we we want the Lord to help us get unstuck. Amen. All right. Well, have a wonderful day, friends, and and I'll be back tomorrow to continue our series on the life of Elijah.